means to, to take care not to offend or exclude any person or group. So you don't want to offend anyone. Uh, I was very proud of uh, our president to uh, when they lit the Christmas tree and uh, at, up in Washington this what was it this week that uh, he said Merry Christmas is back, Amen. Yeah. Y'all agree with that? <laughs> and, and so, uh, but but Christmas, as much as anything, has been greatly affected by this thing of political correctness. And for example, I recently came across a uh, politically uh, correct Christmas greeting. You'll love this, okay? Best wishes for an environmentally conscious, socially responsible, low stress, non-addictive, gender neutral, winter solstice holiday. <laughs> Practice within the most joyous traditions of the religious persuasion of your choice, but with respect for the religious persuasion of others who choose to practice their own religion as well as those who choose to practice no religion at all. So that's the greeting, okay? For That's instead of Merry Christmas. That's what we are supposed to have now, right? Uh, you know, you, you take the uh, many of the traditional and familiar Christmas songs and according to those who would practice this, this crazy thing of political correctness, uh, uh, the word Christmas is considered offensive, therefore it must be removed. And so, and since it cannot be replaced with the word, even the word holiday uh, is a version of holy day, so that's not even good anymore. And so it must be replaced with a less offensive phrase. They came up with this, day off. <laughs> Therefore, we wish you a Merry Christmas, should be, we wish you a Merry, non-religious, specific day off in winter. Uh, and since we cannot lay any uh, covert references to race to be interjected into whatever we're doing, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. It should now be, I'm dreaming of a race, immaterial, non-religious, specific day off in winter. <laughs> And we don't want to forget about the secularist, uh, secularist, therefore, O come all ye faithful, should be, O come all ye of extreme loyalty to non-material evidence. <laughs> and a person should not feel excluded based on where they live, what kind of, therefore, go tell it on the mountain, should be, go tell it on the preferred geographical location of your choice. <laughs> Physical description should be eliminated. Therefore, a little drummer boy becomes now vertically challenged drummer child of undetermined gender. And we certainly want, wouldn't want to stereotype overweight people as being happy, So, nor make reference to a person's age or apply religious terms. Therefore, jolly old Saint Nicholas should be happy, plus-sized, chronologically gifted, Highly virtuous Nicholas. <laughs> Finally, the words over the river and through the woods, the grandmother's house we go, should be substituted with only, or subtitled with, only after an environmental impact study on the effects of a horse drawn sleigh upon the woods is conducted. And assuming the gentle vegetarian beast of a horse is not being forced to pull an overweight loaded sleigh and is doing so on a volunteer basis. <laughs> We have gone crazy, haven't we, <laughs> in America. Now, it may not be politically correct to put Christ in Christmas, but the truth is, there is no Christmas apart from Christ. Amen. And as the saying goes, Jesus is the reason for the season. And as we enter into another Christmas season, I want us to spend a few weeks now thinking about the real meaning of Christmas. Uh, and in John chapter 1, in verse 14, I want to call your attention to that verse. We'll put it up on the screen here. And John 1, 14, we have, in, in just one sentence, we have what Christmas is all about. Right. The Bible says there, if you've got your Bibles open or you can look up on the screen, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was made flesh. I know of no, no single statement that better sums up the meaning of Christmas than that. For a few weeks, I want us to think about the Word becoming flesh. And no doubt the subject of that sentence, let's just change this a little bit, and you can see it there. The subject of the sentence is what? It's the, the Word, right? 
Uh, would you agree? And, it, and now, a word is a powerful thing. When a man gets down on one knee to propose to his sweetheart and uh, ask for her hand in marriage, the word she says in response will mean the difference between crushing heartache or joyful bliss, right? Yeah. When a charismatic leader speaks uh, to his persuasive words, it can spur thousands into action. When a trusted friend speaks a word of caution, it can stop you dead in your tracks. One word can be enough to lift you out of sadness. Another word can be enough to send you spiraling into despair. One simple word can change your life forever. One little word can mean the difference between, between life and death. Whether it is a quiet or loud, whispered or shouted, a word is a powerful thing. But then there is the word. The one that's mentioned here in verse 14 of the Gospel of John. The person who became flesh and dwelt among us. The man-child who was the only begotten of the Heavenly Father. The one who was full of grace and truth. We know him by the name Jesus, don't we? He is the Word. He's called here in John's Gospel, the Word. But he is not some simple utterance that uh, comes out of our mouths. He's not some arrangement of letters spread across the page. He's not, no, he's someone that's existed before time ever began. He will continue to exist after time has come to an end. And everything that exists, everything that is both visible and invisible, all of it came uh, uh, about through this one we call the Word. Talk about from the lowliest or the, the loftiest mountains to the lowest valleys, to, from the largest creatures to the tiniest of insects, from the most massive of suns and planets to the most microscopic of atoms. None of it would exist without Him. All that has life and breath only has it because the Word spoke and it caused it to be. And there's nothing that can compare to the Word. Because the Word is God, we're told. We'll see that in Scripture in a moment. The Word is the most powerful person that is, that ever was, and that ever will be. But our verse says the Word was made flesh. He was God, but He became human. He became flesh for us. And with those five simple words, God... It's like he cracks open our brain or something like an egg, you know, so that we, and, and spilling forth thoughts of wonder and awe as we struggle to comprehend even a fraction of what that means. Frankly, we don't understand that incarnation as we would like to. Just think of what happened when Jesus, the Word, was born. The infinite became finite. The eternal became temporary. The almighty became weak. The big became small. God, who exists outside of every realm of understanding that we have, suddenly made himself like us. He formed himself in such a miraculous way that God would dwell with men. The Word was made flesh. Why? So that his head could be covered with a crown of thorns. So that his hands and feet could be pierced with nails. So that his back could be flogged and lashed. So that his body could be sacrificed and giving unto death uh, so that we would receive life. The Word was made flesh. Why? So that after his death, there could also be a resurrection. There could be right. a coming back to life. A declaration that all is forgiven, an assurance that death is defeated, a proclamation that the devil has been trampled underfoot, a promise that he will one day return and that we will live with him forever. That's the real Christmas story. And over the next four weeks, we're going to take a look, a closer look. Let me just put up another slide here. We're going, to, we're going to take a closer look at a few aspects of the Word who is made flesh. We're going to talk about His deity this morning for a few moments. Next week, we're going to look at His humanity and how we, when He became flesh, He took on human humanity like we have. And then the following week, we'll look at His glory. And the last week, on um, Christmas Eve, we'll look at his legacy, the word, his legacy. Before we look at the word, his divinity this morning, let me clarify who the word is once again in case you missed it. When Jesus said the word was made flesh, he's making it very clear 
who the Word is. The Word is the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. The Word is His divine title. Jesus is His God-given name. Now, I want us to read this morning. I hope you got your Bible open. We're going to begin at verse 1. We're going to read down to verse 4. I wish we had time to read the whole chapter, but uh, we'll read down to verse 4, then we're going to go to verse 10 and read down through verse 14. Is, all right? is that all right with you all? Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. I'm going to do it anyway. So. <laughs> Now, and just think of it this way, I mean, you, could, you could read the text like this, almost you could replace the word word with Jesus and it would make as much sense, right. right? In the beginning was the word, in the beginning was Jesus. And the word was with God, in other words, Jesus was with God and, and the word was God and Jesus was God. Right. You understand that? Okay. The same was in the beginning with God and all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the life of men. I'm sorry, I should have put that verse up there. We just read those verses. But go to verse 10. He, that's Jesus, was in the word, or was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him. Who's the him? Jesus. Jesus, the word. To them, those that believe, those that receive, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of man, or flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word, that's Jesus, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I want to stop and pray. Father. I want to thank you for the word of God today. I want to thank you for the written word that we have in our hands today. The written word that uh, gives us the good news of the gospel that teaches us about the Lord Jesus and about you, Father, and about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. I want to thank you for the word of God that tells us about this, this fellowship we call a church and that, uh, that Jesus started here in his ministry. And Lord, we, we're just so grateful we can gather together on this Lord's Day to study the precious Word of God, to learn more about you, become more acquainted with you and your, your power and your glory and your majesty and your grace and your truth and all of the things that, that, are, that surround Jesus while he was here on this earth and, and that surround him now while he's in heaven and that surrounded him even before he came to this earth. And so Lord, today, enlighten us, encourage us, Lord, bring conviction to that one who perhaps is lost today and doesn't know Jesus as their own Savior. May they trust you today before it's eternally too late. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now the word, word, is a title that's exclusive to the writings of the Apostle John. The title comes from the Greek word logos, which means to say something, or to give a message, or to proclaim something. Now the word speaks of communicating. And the idea is that Jesus communicates or reveals the Father to us. We read in John in chapter 1, if you'll just look at verse 18 real quick, I'll read that verse. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. That's what words do. They declare, right? That's what Jesus did. You see, Jesus is the great revelation of the Father. No one has ever seen God directly, but in Jesus we see the Father. He said, I and my Father are one. You've seen me, you've seen the Father, Jesus explained. And as we look at the Word becoming flesh, and we're going to go back to these first few verses here in John chapter 1, those first four verses, and we see the Word uh, becoming flesh. We, we see that he declares some, some, some things to us this morning that are very, very important, very vital to our Christian life, to our understanding of the Word of God, and to our faith. Look at that first sentence of verse 1 again. We read here, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, verse 2 says. This is one of the great statements of the Bible concerning the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's point number one. Jesus is God. Say it with me. 
Jesus is God. Okay? It is a clear and definite declaration that Jesus is in fact divine, that he is deity, that he is God. He's not a God. He's not another God. He's not a different God. He is God. Yeah. One of the greatest tenets of our faith is this fact that of the deity of Jesus Christ. The philosopher John Mill called Jesus, is what he said about Jesus. Jesus is a preeminent genius and probably the greatest moral reformer and martyr who has ever existed on earth, the ideal representative and guide of humanity. Thank you very much, Dr. Mill. But Jesus was more than a preeminent genius. He was more than a great moral reformer. He was more than a martyr who went to his death uh, for cause. Jesus was and is God. Do you understand yeah. that this morning? Right. And in our day and time, when doctrine is somewhat minim minim minimized on the grounds of unity, and I, I think it's important that we Christians nail down certain beliefs and hold them as essential pillars of our faith. And one of those truths is the deity of Jesus Christ. And I have no patience or tolerance with anyone who compromises or denies that deity. Amen. Right. Of the Lord. As we look closer at the deity of Christ, we, it's declared here in our text. Let me point out a couple of things that speak of his deity. First of all, notice that there is the pre-existence of Christ in these verses. Right. In the words, in the beginning, takes us back to where? Yeah. Yeah. Back to the beginning of, of everything, right? Back before there was anything. Uh, back in time, back in, in space, it seems. Back. He takes us to the beginning of all things as we know them. Uh, to the create back to the creation of the universe, and they tell us that before all things came into being, Jesus was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. They declare that when all things had a beginning, Jesus already existed at that moment. He existed before any thing else came into being. He existed along with the Father. You see, the word was is a word that's often used for deity. It comes from the word, we get our word, I am, or the, in, the, in the Bible, the, when, when God says his name is I am, it's the same kind of word to be. It speaks of that which is of continuous existence, without beginning or origin. In the beginning, we see the one who had no beginning. Jesus is eternal. The Bible says in Psalm 90, in verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, and even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Now, if we could walk back to the very first moment of time and there stand on the edge of eternity, you'd find Jesus. If we were possible to step off that edge and travel eons of time back into uh, eternity, you'd still find Jesus. In fact, no matter how far back into eternity you traveled, you would always find him already existing. There's never been a moment when he, not, when he was not existing. There will never be a moment when he does not exist. So furthermore, we see not only the preexistence of Christ, but we see the person of Christ. There are two great statements about the person of Christ in that first verse. He said he was with God, and secondly, he was God. Both of them speak of that. Literally, the word with, the idea of being with God, uh, <clears throat> declares that they are one. Remember what a, uh, the angel said to Mary when she, when she gave birth to a son? He said, thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is what? God with us. Angels, this is it. God's here. He's with you. And when we talk about the Trinity, we're not talking about three gods. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is separate. We're, no, we're talking about one God manifested in three persons. Jesus is one of those persons. Jesus is God. Secondly, I want you to know this morning that Jesus is not only God, but Jesus is great. He's great. Amen. Uh, we have a great Savior, don't we? We read in verse 3, and all things were 
made by him. It's at verse 3, it's up there. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life. And the life was the light of men. Jesus is great. He's great because he has unlimited power. His unlimited power in creation is seen in that out of nothing he brought forth all things. It's hard to imagine for us a state of complete nothingness, isn't it? I mean, you know, to, to think about, uh, we tend to think of a state of emptiness maybe or, or something, but in our mind we imagine an empty universe that's absent of, of, of perhaps any stars or any planets, and, and that would mean that, but, but that, would mean the, the universe itself was there. Perhaps it wasn't. And there was this absolute state of nothing. But out of that state of nothingness, God simply spoke the word and all things instantly came into existence. A few years ago in a magazine interview uh, called The Slate Magazine, Andrew Linde, he's a physicist at Stanford University, he said that it wouldn't take much it wouldn't take too, uh, much to create a new universe. This guy's really smart. Hey, man, you know, you know. Uh, he, he said all that it would take to get a universe like ours started is, is one hundred, uh, a hundred thousandths of a gram of matter. He says that's all I would need to start a new universe. <laughs> he even added that we can't rule out the possibility that our own universe was created in a lab by someone in another universe who felt like doing it. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, in the first place, I never cease to be amazed at the levels of intelligence that we find in our so-called institutions of higher learning. <laughs> with such comments by one of their professors, I understand why parents pay, you know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year to send their children to Stanford, right? But furthermore, I would recommend that Mr. Linde try his theory and see if it works. Uh, I would recommend that uh, uh, maybe he's dissatisfied with this universe, you know, with this, this creation. Just start your own. And I would recommend that if it's so easy to create a universe, then go ahead and create one. And, and I would also say that if he really thinks it would be that hard, uh, it wouldn't be that hard to create a universe, start without having any matter at all. Then I'd really be impressed with his intelligence. Well, the simple truth of the matter is that man at his greatest could never create right. what the Word created. Amen. Right. Amen. Man may be able to do some amazing things, but it's far beyond our capacity to create something out of nothing. Only God can do that. And that's exactly what God, Jesus, did. Right. Notice his unquestionable power. It says in verse number three, all things were made by him. And then it, then it adds this little statement of that. That would have been enough for me. I don't believe that, right? He made everything. But then it adds a second statement that says, and without him was not anything made that was made. I don't want you to misunderstand, John said. Not only did he, did, did, was he responsible for making everything, uh, they were all made by him, but there wasn't anything that was made that he didn't make. That's unquestioned power, right? The hymn writer expressed his greatness. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thine hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Yes, Jesus is God. I tell you this morning, Jesus is also great. Amen. There's a third factor. We'll look at it real quickly, and that's this. Jesus is also gracious. I will draw your attention back to verse 14 of our text there, please. And the Word was made flesh. Next week we'll consider more in detail how that could have happened, how that happened. But it says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of, tell me what he's full of, grace, grace and truth. Grace and truth. Verse 17 of this chapter says, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He is gracious. And when we talk about grace, we're talking about what God has done for us. 
the unmerited favor of God. You see, anything God does for us, I believe, is an act of grace. And furthermore, when we talk about grace, we're simply we're talking about how we are undeserving of what God has done for us. Grace simply means that we did not deserve what God did. He did it anyway. Right. Sending Jesus was an act of grace. Sending him here as a little baby was an act of grace. Amen? God shows us grace, by the way, by granting us mercy. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were convicted of being Russian spies, convicted of treason against the United States of America in 1951. They were later executed for their crimes, and the summation of, at the end of their trial, a lawyer for them animately said to Judge Kaufman, who presided over the trial, he said, Your Honor, what my clients ask for is justice. Judge Kaufman calmly replied, the court has given what you have asked for, justice. What you really want is mercy. But that is something this court has no right to give. Amen. God has a right to give it. Right. By the way, you don't want justice when you stand before God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You want grace. You want mercy. Uh, you know, uh, we don't we don't want to face him on the basis of, hey, hey, I lived a pretty good life. I think I'll be all right. No, it's not going to get it done. Well, I went to church. Okay, good for you. It's not going to get it done. Well, I gave tithes and offering. No, that's great, but that's not going to be enough when you stand before the Father. Amen. You don't want justice. You want mercy. And if you have any doubts about God's love and God's grace, look to the manger at Bethlehem. There you see a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. That very baby was God in the flesh. And his conception had been miraculous by virgin. His birth was attended by angels who sang, praise God, and say, I said, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Paul said in, in Titus 2, verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. The Word made flesh, you see, is a message of God's grace. Jesus stepped from the heights of deity down to the depths of humanity. He gave up heaven's light for earth's darkness. He gave up heaven's grace for earth's guilt. He gave up heaven's peace for earth's strife. Heaven's love for earth's hate. And heaven's wealth for earth's poverty. Heaven's clothing for earth's nakedness. And heaven's life for earth's death. But oh, what a night when the Word was made flesh. Because Jesus brought with him grace when he came. And that's what we need in our lives this morning. Would you bow your head with me today? Father, we give you thanks for the Lord Jesus Christ today. We eternally grateful in our hearts for the grace of God that brought salvation to us. We're thankful for the way of salvation, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. And we do not come before you and parade our works before you, or our goodness before you, or our worthiness, Lord. We come just uh, just falling and saying, it's by the grace, God, the grace of God that my sins have been forgiven. It's by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ who died for me on Calvary that I stand before you, Father. My only right to heaven is the grace of God and his forgiveness. And Lord, today, if there's someone that's lost today, pray they didn't come to know you as Savior. Lord, if there's a Christian here who's been doubting you or doubting your word or doubting that your, your power, I pray that they would get that right with you today, Lord, and submit to you in obedience to you. Father, we just love you today, and thank you for Jesus. We look forward, Lord, to studying this month about the Word, about your deity, about your humanity, about your glory, about your legacy, Lord, and I pray you would use each message to strengthen our faith and encourage our resolve to live for you, and, and Lord, uh, and brighten and, and uh, our witness for you, Lord, we pray in this world. We thank you that you're the light, the light of the world, the world needs to see. 
And Lord, would you open the, the eyes of someone that's in spiritual darkness today and shine the light of the glory of the gospel into their lives so that they can be saved. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Stand, please.